Keir Starmer has laid out six key pledges for a Labour government should they win power this election year. So what is the Labour leader promising? And will those promises be kept? All ambitions, particularly our ambition to change your country for the better, have to start with first steps. So here we are. One card, six steps, in your hand, a plan to change the country. OK, so let's start by looking at these six pledges. Let me just run through them quickly. So first up, sticking to tough spending rules in order to deliver economic stability. Cutting NHS waiting lists by providing 40,000 more appointments each week. That's going to be funded by tackling tax avoidance and non-DOM loopholes. Third, launching a border security command to stop the gangs, arranging small boat crossings. Fourth, setting up Great British Energy, a publicly owned clean power energy company. Fifth, providing more neighbourhood police officers to reduce antisocial behaviour and introduce new penalties for offenders. And finally, recruiting six and a half thousand teachers paid for through ending tax breaks for private schools. OK, George, kick us off. Who, who are these pledges aimed at? So they're aimed at swing voters, you know, the voters who decide elections. <clears throat> these pledges, they all reference the, the themes that normally come up at election time. The economy, NHS, schools, crime. crime. Uh, and one, one thing that jumps out for me is, is there's clearly been a late addition uh, which is the pledge on on border command and security. That's really a, a bid to close down a potential vulnerability on immigration should the Rwanda scheme uh, prove a political success for the government. It's not at the moment, but Labour clearly sees the potential for the Conservatives to try and outflank them on that issue. But otherwise, they really reaffirm the, the five missions that uh, Starmer's had for some time now. Yeah, I mean, they were quite vague, weren't they, the missions that we heard last year? Uh, build an NHS fit for the future, make Britain's streets safe, break down barriers to opportunity. There's a bit bit more detail from these. I mean, I'm interested, how how late was this new edition with the, the border command? Well, so it, it's, Keir Starmer made a speech on this um, last week. So it's, it, it, it is a very recent edition. In fact, uh, you can see in the uh, the email they sent round, the formatting on that one was slightly different. So it was, you could, you could, you could, you could literally read, read, read between the lines on, uh, on that one. Um, but otherwise, in terms of Labour policy, <clears throat> Their, their emphasis has been very much on continuity. And um, a Labour aide recently cited to me the example of um, John McDonald's uh, pledge on to nationalise broadband, for instance, free broadband, and then the pledge to sort of compensate the WASPY women as what they didn't want to do. They don't want to suddenly drop expensive, radical pledges uh, in the middle of an election campaign because that would undermine their message, which is that it's it's about stability and we can be trusted with the public finances. I mean, Freddie, why do you think we're hearing this now? I remember speaking to one Labour aide a year ago or two years ago, 18 months, and, and they were essentially saying that the plan is we're going to announce the missions through these five big, uh, broad speeches that Keir Starmer and the Shadow Cabinet delivered uh, at the start of last year, and then we're going to funnel it down. Uh, we're going to distill it into these these more classic retail policies that are more uh, wieldy on the, on the doorstep, something that voters can actually understand. We've got to remember that when we had those speeches, they were, they were quite ambiguous, uh, quite abstract, quite academic. In, in certain ways, the big one was we're going to achieve the highest growth uh, in the G7 over two consecutive years. No one really understands what that means, and it, it's not very political. So, same with mission-oriented government or whatever, whatever that means. So that's the idea. The idea is to create this this pledge card or, or my first steps, I think, as Keir Starmer is calling it, um, uh, so that so that campaigners, activists can communicate Labour's policies in a much more simplistic, uh, accessible way. There's a bit of variety in there, though, isn't there? Because some of them will be very easy to measure. You know, we'll know if Labour recruits six and a half thousand new teachers. We'll know if Great British Energy has been set up. But but others feel incredibly vague. And I just wonder, for example, reducing antisocial behaviour. How are we going to measure that, George? Yeah, I suppose it depends how you define anti anti social behaviour. Obviously, governments can tweak the the definition. I think that's a gesture towards what a increasingly uh, big political issue crime has become because of the police cuts we've seen, because of the damage that austerity's done to the the public realm, that that loss of uh, sort of social uh, control and 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 stability. So I think it's it's a gesture towards towards you know, often often low income voters for whom you know antisocial behaviour is 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 a genuine problem in their day to day lives. 
But are they promises that we won't be able to tell whether they've been kept or not, some of them? Well, I mean, it's tricky because on, on the crime one, on the crime mission, you've got the, the headline target, which is to half uh, crime or violent crime against women and girls. So that's quite specific. And we will be able to to measure that. These are these are gestures. These are signals. These are their slogans. So I, I think it's slightly different. You have to go back into the, the briefing documents that we got with the missions to find those individual targets. You know, it took a long time for Labour to clarify that it was GDP per capita that they were going to measure rather than just GDP, which is quite an important difference. But obviously, they're not going to have that on their little credit card and the Apple wallet app or whatever they've got going on this morning. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're elsewhere. I mean, sticking with the economics behind it, are you persuaded by how they've explained that they will fund certain ones of these pledges? For example, mm-hmm. the six and a half thousand teachers they say is going to come from reducing or scrapping VAT on private school fees. Are you persuaded by that? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, a helpful measure for Labour, and it's politically popular. It's populist, actually. Obviously, they 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 like to point out, you know, only seven percent of people went to to private school, and it's a policy the Conservatives haven't stolen. So the Conservatives obviously uh, stole their uh, their pledge to abolish non dub status, which also appears there. Labour subsequently uh, announced a, a tougher version of that, but I think I think on that there will be legal challenges. But most expect um, the measure to to go through. Okay, the question will be: Does it does it raise as much as they hope? But it's an interesting. It's interesting. It's worth um, remembering this whole idea of the the pledge card, although Labour aren't calling it that, comes from the Blair era when he they had their new Labour five points pledge card, which was seen as a great sort of political success. So this is sort of Labour's attempt to do a version of that. And there's some continuity and there's some change. So on the continuity side. Labour pledged to scrap the assisted places scheme as it was known then, which helped fund places uh, for uh, children at, at, at private schools. That was scrapped because it was seen as a state subsidy. And so there is continuity there. You know, at the moment, private schools get VAT exemptions and Labour, it's a bit of a bit of class warfare, you could say, saying that we don't think you know, hardworking taxpayers should have to subsidise private education. I mean, you mentioned Blair was a success, but... I mean, some of our younger listeners might not remember the the Ed Stone of 2015, mm. but not not such a success. No, really. not a success at all. I mean, Ed Miliband didn't have the the perhaps the charismatic uh, demeanour that was necessary to pull such a such a stone off. Um, but you know, with Blair and with, and with Ed Miliband, George is right to say there is this sort of continuity of we need to explain to the public in very simple terms what we do. But going back to the pledge card, it seems Tony Blair's pledge card that was very shallow. There was not actually much in there. You know, it was quite unambitious, um, and it didn't tell you that much. I think about what New Labour were going to do in in office. We got to remember, that, you know, the national uh, minimum wage wasn't on there. Neither was independence of the Bank of England. There wasn't this huge constitutional social change that we saw over the next ten years with devolution, the creation of the Supreme Court, um, the Human Rights Act. So. It's it's retail stuff, and it's just, it goes back to what you were saying about the private schools. Is it going to raise enough money? You know, is six and a half thousand teachers um, is that achievable? Sure, it is. It's just I don't think it really gets to the heart of what we're going to see from a Keir Starmer government. They were talking about you know a couple of billion pounds here, a few thousand teachers. This is not what it's really about. Over what time frame are they promising or pledging to deliver these? Well, they, they talk about a decade of national renewal. So some of the some of the the missions are really intended to to span a decade. Others you'd want to see within the first uh, hundred days. They'll be bringing forward legislation on GB Energy. Some the the the, the metric would be how how what does it look like after a, a first term. But it's interesting. Some of them are 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 quite vague. I mean, the one on economic stability, for instance, where you might say. You know, economic stability is something that's nice to have. It's maybe a precondition, but it's not a sort of big ambition. But really, that I think is is doing two things politically. It's reassuring people that Labour can be trusted with the economy, because obviously the Conservatives still like to say, you know, the crash happened on 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 your watch. Um, you crashed the car, and so on. Labour always uh, runs out of money, um, but it's also designed to say we won't be Liz Truss. You know, that's the reference, the pointed reference to mortgage is that Liz Truss is an ultimate political gift for, for Labour at the moment because they think however hard Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt try to tell a better story about the economy, and we obviously saw GDP growth of 0.6% in the first quarter, Labour will just remind people of Liz Truss and, and, and the cost of living crisis, and that will undermine any attempt by the Tories to transform their fortunes. But it is interesting, isn't it, that we've... T- Got, we've gone from one of the most ambitious missions to have 
the highest growth in the G7 for two years to uh, economic stability, which seems to be a return to the, the status quo ante. I found it remarkable in uh, Rachel Reeves' May's lecture when she said stability is change. Uh, it's, it's the least ambitious phrasing that you could create. And maybe that's necessary, as you, as you set out, George. Politically, I don't think it's harming them at the moment. If you look at the, the polling numbers on who voters trust on the economy, Labour is surging ahead. It's, get, it's increasing at the moment. So, sure, I think it works politically, but we need to also be realistic about how ambitious they're being. Just want to touch briefly on the aesthetics of today, because two things, really. You've got the entire shadow cabinet accompanying mm. Keir Starmer in Essex today. And then coupled with that, you've mentioned it already, Freddie, it's my first steps. Keir Starmer there with his sleeves rolled up, looking very cash. And I just wonder what significance we should read into those two things, really, this full backing of the shadow cabinet, bringing everyone together. And it's this kind of what seems to be a very personal message about Keir Starmer as opposed to Labour. George, do you want to... Coming yes. There? So I think look, all um, political election campaigns now inevitably tend somewhat towards the presidential. We'll have the uh, the TV debates. I think the focus on Starmer partly reflects that, but I think it's also an attempt by uh, him and his team to really reintroduce him to the British public. Because there's a sense that you know, he's been leader of the opposition now for four years, but some still aren't sure what he stands for, what kind of prime minister he would really be. Partly that's because the language around the missions is quite technocratic, quite often quite uh, complex. This is an attempt to sort of distill what Labour stands for and the kind of prime minister that, that Keir Starmer would be. And then having the whole shadow cabinet there, I suppose it's sending the message of sort of government in waiting. Because I think we write about it in The Leader this week. There has been a bit of a political vibe shift, I think, since the elections in terms of the focus really shifting towards Labour and almost you know, what Labour say they would do now in in office matters more than what Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are talking about because no one expects him to be in office much longer. Yeah, Freddie, I want to I want to talk to you about another big event earlier this week and how it links in with today's pledges. So you wrote in Morning Call about the Labour leadership's meeting with the unions to mm. talk about the New Deal for working people. Just b before we get into that, just talk us through what it is and how it's changed and what this meeting was about. Yeah, the, the New Deal for Working People is this tranche, this collection of, of uh, improvements to workers' rights and um, and union rights as well that they proposed, I think it was around two years ago or maybe a little bit further back. In July last year, um, it got watered down a little bit. So there was various uh, policies where they said they'd either consult business on or, for instance, take the, the fair pay agreements where a government sets up a framework and says this individual sector has to negotiate with the companies in that sector and you get sort of a baseline. Mm -hmm. They originally said they wanted to roll this out in all sectors of the economy. Last July, they said, we'll start with the social care sector. So there's a series of these things. Same with uh, scrapping zero-hour contracts. That was let's scrap them, and now it's okay. Well, maybe there's we can have a slight negotiation between the employer and the employee, uh, and if they agree, uh, then it's fine. So that there's, it's, it's slightly ambiguous. You, when that happened, you did see some anger and I think suspicion from the union movement, particularly from Sharon Graham, who leads the Unite Union. She's been a fervent critic of of Keir Starmer. So it all came to she a head. She called it a betrayal, didn't she? She did, yeah. I mean, and she's been very very active in the, in the media, criticising Labour for this. It all came to a head uh, this week with this, this sort of threat. I think it was three, four hour long meeting. And I think it was a success for, for Keir Starmer. Angela Renner was there. I think Rachel Reeves was there. Um, because the unions came out and they said, we've got a, we've got an agreement uh, and we're happy with this. Sharon, uh, Sharon Graham said the same. So she was she was included in that consensus, which I think is a good sign for, for, for Keir Starmer in, in terms of maintaining that amicable uh, collaborative relationship with the unions. Um, and it's probably a good sign that the, the New Deal for working, working, working People is going to survive. Should the unions be reading anything into the fact that it's not... <laughs> One of these six pledges. Yeah. I mean, you know, Labour spokesperson quoted this morning as saying these these are the things we need to put up in lights. We've already talked about there are cards being printed. You can put them in your wallet, in your purse. 
I mean, that is not on there, and yet it's perceived to be a major policy. Yeah, why is that? Maybe it's because these were originally designed as missions for government, as in they're going to take a long time. We need to set up delivery units in in um, in Whitehall. We need to cross departmental cooperation. You know, there's a huge amount of effort, and maybe perhaps they see um, improving workers' rights, which is something you know, some of it they can do with secondary leg- legislation, some of it with primary. It doesn't cost much money. Um, it's much more of a sort of administrative, legislative change. So maybe that's why. I'm not sure, but I, I think you're you're right to you're right to raise that. It's the same with planning and with housing. That's not on there as well. And many people would say that's central and key to Labour's economic policy and also how they want to change the country. And it's also quite high on people's priorities. But it's not there again, which which is interesting. George, do you think on the left of the party there will be a concern because we have seen a rowback on other policy commitments, haven't we? Famously, the, the 28 billion mm. and also tuition fees. Do you think there will be a bit of nervousness about sort of knocking back housing and the workers' rights? I think there is nervousness around all pledges, uh, particularly because we're approaching crunch points of the of the manifesto. And then there has been the U-turn on the, on the 28 billion. I think the distinction we can make with the 28 billion and other pledges is that that was partly abandoned because it was seen as breaching the, the fiscal rules that Rachel Reeves has. And that obviously reflects that uh, economic stability pledge and measures such as uh, the New Deal for Working People, renationalizing the railways, setting up GB Energy, they're seen as costed, affordable. Uh, I mean, the New Deal for Working People that they hope that will boost economic growth by raising uh, labour market standards. So I think I think those 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 will survive because they are key for the political projects. But one concern people on the left do have at the moment is the lack of any distinctive anti-policy pledge. So they say New Labour had the minimum wage. It went on to have tax credits. It was the most redistributive government since the Attlee government by some measures. They say, look, that's that's the hole in Keir Starmer's political project at the moment. We hear a lot about economic growth. There's planning reform. There's a distinctive shift on public ownership in a way you didn't see under under New Labour. But they say there's a real gap on that. So I think, I think Labour will need an answer to that point at, at at some time. It's 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 all good and well saying we will boost economic growth, but they are also going to have to answer the question, what would you do to reduce inequality and poverty? But particularly because you've seen a big surge in, in child poverty over the last 14 years. Yeah, I mean it's a good week for Starmer really, hasn't it been, with this sort of agree- agreement for with with the unions at the moment. I mean Peter Mandelson has has warned though that don't make it difficult for employers. I mean, which well, he must be right then. <laughs> if, if Peter Mandelson said it, um, yeah, sure. I mean, that's the big tension at the moment because they're trying to win over business. And do, yeah. do, do you think that, that that's why we're only looking at social care immediately now, rather than across the across the economy? I mean, potentially, but they've been very clear that they don't think there's a contradiction between being pro-worker and pro-employer because, as George just set out, they think if you boost workers' rights, you're going to help boost the economy. Okay, that's their thesis. It's the way in which they triangulate that the, the classic tension or, or conflict between the employer and the employee. I also think that Labour are very conscious of overcoming uh, the legacy of Jeremy Corbyn in 2019. They see that bringing the city on board, businesses on board, um, as central to that. And on top of that, they see the missions as only being deliverable uh, in partnership with the private sector, particularly on the the national grid, renewable energy, uh, planning. They they want they want to hear from the private sector. They want to sort of I think break down some of those separations and silos from between Whitehall and and the private sector. So there's lots of reasons that they're doing it. Um, I think you know. This week we've seen a recommitment to the to the to the New Deal for working people. Let's wait for the consultation. Let's wait uh, for that first year in office because then we'll know. And finally, George, I mean, are the left reassured that the New Deal for working people is really a pet project of Angela Rayner's, and therefore that that is that is a strong indication that's going to happen. Yes, I think that's a good point that she does have ownership of that agenda. She's the elected deputy leader, uh, has her own mandate. Uh, she introduced Keir Starmer at the event actually this morning. I mean, that's a clear sign that 
Uh, they have full confidence that she'll be uh, cleared on the current um, allegations that she avoided capital gains tax and and so on. So yes, I think, it, but I think it, 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 it's sort of deeper than that, which is that you know Keir Starmer has made you know, the dignity of work a key theme, a key personal theme for him, as I said in my Starmerism piece. So I think it would be you know, an abandonment of his own project if that was uh, diluted. And then they do need a real offer for the for the trade unions who they're less reliant on them for funding than they used to be, but they are still key funders. Uh, they have a very key role uh, in the wider Labour family. So I think for all those reasons, that's, that programme will survive. Thank you very much, gentlemen.